This is the last sermon in our series on claiming our promised lands. <clears throat> I don't know if you've been keeping count, but this is the 12th sermon in a series that took us from slavery through the wilderness and into the promised land. Now, I was talking to Justin earlier today, and you know you can't plan some things. But 12 sermons and 12 tribes. When you look over the series and you look at how the series directly impacted our ministry. The week before we went into Reedy Creek and did our community outreach, was the week that we talked about preparing to cross the Jordan. The week we went into Reedy Creek, we talked about the Jordan and going in. And every place we walked, right, was, was a place we claimed for the Lord. And every piece of the process, even when, when they came back and they, they did um, the, the, the first uh, Lord's Supper, we came in and we did the Lord's Supper on the exact same weekend. God has been in control of this series. He's been in control of this ministry. And as long as I am here, he will continue to be in control. Amen. So last week, we focused on dealing with conflict. We saw all of our, all the Israelites make it through to the promised land. And we witnessed them as they learned how to, how to fight and how to battle and how to get through the promised land. Then all of a sudden, there's a conflict between each other. And we talked about last week how, you know, it's good to know how to fight against the Amorites and and, uh, and, and, and the Canaanites and all the termites and everything else in the world. But your primary battle every day is going to be probably with your wife or with your husband, with your children. It's going to probably be with your boss at work, who's probably not a Canaanite. He's probably a Christian just like you. And so we learned some key points last week on, on how, to, how to work through those conflicts that we see that come up from time to time. And this week, the final sermon, we're going to talk about making the right choices. Making the right choices. We pick up chapter 23 and chapter 24 with Joshua's farewell speech. It's good stuff. If you have time to go back and read the chapter, both chapters you should. But, but Joshua is sitting down. He's old. He, he's looking around and he's figuring out some things. And, and, and he's trying to make a difference in, his, in, in the lives of others knowing that he's getting ready to go. He calls everybody together. And he makes them listen to him as he goes through a process of both telling why we should be following God, but also declaring that him and his family, that they're going to serve the Lord. My wife and I, just after my son was born, we had the opportunity to, to go to the bedside of my great-grandmother. She was 96 years old. And we went up, we didn't take Angelo with us, and the first thing that she noticed was our son wasn't with us, and she asked, she said, where's your son? We told her that the doctors, of course, wouldn't let us bring him up into this area of the hospital. She looked at us with those beautiful eyes 
frail skin. She, she could hardly breathe. And she said two things to us. She said, always make sure God is the head of your family. Always make sure God is the head of your family. And the second thing she said was, love each other with the love of Jesus. And those were the last words that I ever heard from my grandmother. We left the hospital, and shortly after that, she went on to be with the Lord. But those words, they impacted me in ways I can't describe today. It put me on the path toward where we're here today at Uplift. I've got a question for you. What will your final words be? I want you to take a second and, and really think about that. If, if you were there with your children, with your grandchildren, with, with, with the closest relatives to you, with the closest friends to you, what would your final words be? I want you to capture that. You got to remember this for later because I'm going to give you an assignment at the end. The second question I have for you today, as I want you to kind of think through, is are your choices in agreement with your final words? See, it wasn't just that Joshua had these great final words, probably some of the greatest words in the Bible. He, he says, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. But his example fit the words. And I don't know about you though, but, but for me, it's hard sometimes for me to take good advice from people who don't live the advice. So I want you just to kind of think about that for a second. Does the choices that you make on a day-to-day -day basis Does it fit the advice that came into your head when I told you to think about it? We looked at the video, and the video, it talked about possessions and the impact of possessions on our lives. See, what my grandmother was doing when she was, was talking to us and giving us advice was very similar to what Joshua was doing here. She was seeing a change in time. She was seeing folk who didn't mind staying in the house and watching television because air conditioners were coming along. She, 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 we didn't think that she saw, but she saw some of the glassy eyes. She smelled some of the liquor. She saw what time we came in at night. She understood some of the inappropriate relationships that were going on, and her fear was the family would lose the promised land that they had worked so hard to bring. My great-grandmother was somewhat like Joshua in this. Over the span of her life, she had, a, uh, had gathered 80 acres and left that to our family. We're talking about deep south, black lady, hard to do kind of stuff. But in her advice, I heard her saying, keep God first. We look at Joshua and, and Joshua lives a, is living a very similar life. Joshua is a perfect example of a person that makes right choices. Think about Joshua. He starts out as a slave in Egypt. 
And he makes his way all the way up to being a leader over all the people. Joshua understands the benefits of making the right choices. And he, he begins to explain those benefits to us in the first part of, of chapter 23. Look, he says, a long time after the Lord had given Israel rest from all the enemies around them, Joshua was old and he was getting on in years. So Joshua was summoned. Joshua was summoned. All of Israel, including its elders, leaders, judges, and, and officers, and said to them, I am old, getting on in years. And you have seen for yourselves everything the Lord your God did to all the nations on your account. He did it for you. Because it was the Lord, your God, who was fighting for you. He says, see, I have allotted these remaining nations to you as an inheritance for your tribes, including all the nations I have destroyed from the Jordan westward to the Mediterranean Sea. The Lord, your God, will force them back on your account, all for you and drive them out before you so that you can take possession, so that you can have stuff that didn't even belong to you of their land and as the Lord your God promised you. So the first thing that we see here are the benefits to making the right choices. Let's look at Joshua for a second. Of all the spies that were sent out, only Joshua and Caleb trusted God. Remember that? Word? That's where we started at. And because of one choice, God redirects his entire life. He starts by elevating him. Remember that? But, but not only does he elevate him, he protects him. They go out, they win every battle except for one. And then on the one that they, they didn't win, he, God came back and gave them victory over that. He provided for them. When they were in the wilderness, he provided a manna. But he didn't just provide a manna. He brought them into a place full of milk and honey. And then finally, he gave them favor. And God wants to do the same thing for each one of you, for each one of us. As we make the right choices, as we make choices to serve God, as we make choices to move toward a more godly lifestyle and to serve others, God begins by elevating us. See, God will take you right where you are and elevate you. Not, not, not to bring you any glory but to bring him glory, to, to reach people that he can't necessarily reach. It does not matter what happened in your past. It doesn't matter who hurt you. It doesn't matter what mistake you are. Joshua came from slavery to leadership in the promised land. It does not matter how far you've fallen. It doesn't matter who you hurt. It doesn't matter what your mother did to you or your father did to you, whether they left you and abandoned you or beat you. It does not matter what you look like. It doesn't matter how strong you are. It does not matter whatever has happened in your past does not matter. God can use you. He can elevate you as you make right decisions and, and as you make right choices. He begins to protect you. He begins to provide for you and for your family. He, he begins to give you 
favor. That's, that's undeserved mercy and grace. <clears throat> so I want to look at today, and I want us to focus in on the keys to making the right choices. The keys to making the right choices. If you guys turn with me to, to the 24th chapter of Joshua, we'll spend the rest of the time in that book, in that chapter. First thing we see is, if we want to make right choices, We've got to get to a place in our lives where we make God the center of every decision that we make. It's got to be the center. Not of some of them, of every one of them. I was in the gas station, I followed somebody in the gas station, and I, I heard this person just kind of just kind of praying a little bit. Lord, help me, I need you. Lord, 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 just open this door for me. Lord, I trust you. I promise I'm going to serve you. Just help me. Please, please help me. And I, I was thinking about doing some ministry and trying to figure out exactly what my response would be. I thought it was a beautiful thing. And, and so I kind of followed him up to the counter. And as I got to the counter, I heard her say, let me get two power balls. You choose the numbers. <laughs> See, we invite God in to the wrong stuff a lot of the times. I'm not telling you not to ask God to help you when you're trying to get the Powerball and win the millions and don't forget to tie that. But I'm not telling you any of that kind of stuff. I'm not telling you not to call on God when you need that 70 yard field goal or that last minute full court shot. But there are other times when we should be calling on God. Before we go into an argument with our spouse, we should call on God. Before we sit down to discipline our children and, and God knows I need this. We need to call on God. Before you go into work and, and discuss those things with your boss, you need to call on God. When you get the project, call on God. Let's not wait until the project's going south to start calling on God. Look at verse 1. Joshua assembled all the tribes of Israel at Shechem and summoned Israel's elders leaders, judges, and, and officers. And they presented themselves before God. First thing he does when he pulls everybody together is he makes them present themselves before God. They don't discuss anything without God being present. Look at verse 2. He says, it says, Joshua said to all the people, this is what the Lord, not me, Not the elders, not the pastor, not my husband, not my daddy. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. He doesn't even start the conversation. So in other words, the conversation started days before the meeting. See, he had been praying and meditating and waiting and waiting and praying and meditating and waiting. The Bible says that maybe 10 to 14 years between the last time we hear from Israelites and this meeting. And sometimes when we are trying to make a good decision, the word from God doesn't come quickly and we get out in front of it. We start making decisions that, that damage us, that hurt our children, that impact our futures because we won't wait to hear from God. Listen, every decision that we make, every choice that you make has to be centered in God. The, the second key to making the right choice is to remember past wins. 
Look at verses 3 through 13. Now, I'm not going to read all that. But I do want you to go back and read it. But in verses 3 through 13, Joshua takes some time to go through the entire history of what God had done. All the way back from when God first spoke to Moses' his father. And he, and he brings us all the way forward. But, but, but the thing I like best about it is that he is speaking on behalf of God. He gives God the glory for every single thing that happens inside of this paragraph. If you go back and read it, he never says what Joshua did. He always says what, what God did. And see, as we go into situations where we have to make especially critical decisions and choices, we need to start by looking at past wins. When, what did I do in the past that worked? What, what are times in my life when God worked? And what were the situations surrounding that? What did I start? Oh, I started with prayer. Oh, wow. I'm starting to see a trend here. I was patient. I'm starting to see a trend here. The, the, the second thing he does is, as he remembers what God uh, uh, has done, he takes a very close look at everything. Look at the words that he said that God, that he uses to show what God has done. He said, God said, I took, I gave, I sent, I bought you out. I handed them over. And as you do an honest assessment of your life, of your time in your marriage, in your promised land, whether it be at your job, whether it be with your children in your promised land, if you do an honest assessment, you will see what God is always working. No matter what's going on in your, in your family or in your situation, you're making it through, not because of your own will, not because of your hard work, not, not because of your determination. Most of the stuff you can't even explain. You look back on periods of time when you, when you know you didn't have enough money and bills got paid and nothing got turned off. Folk didn't kill each other. You know, they, they, they made it through. You, you look at times in your marriage when things were at their worst point. You didn't know how you were going to make it through and God got you through it. He gave. He, he sent. He's always working in a verb. He's always working in the proactive, not in the reactive. He's always ahead of you. I know Robert can attest to that. 20 years of marriage. You don't make it through 20 years without God being in the midst. Third key to making the right choice is by making serving God a priority. Look at verses 14 and 15. In verse 14 he says, Therefore, fear the Lord and worship Him in sincerity and truth. Don't just go out yelling and screaming and running around and, and doing a bunch of stuff to be seen, but you need to worship in sincerity and in truth. Amen. I'll tell you, the primary reason that we should do that is because nobody buys the other stuff. Mm -hmm. When we're doing all that other stuff and, and when we're out trying to look Christian and out trying to be seen as Christian and, and all those types of things, what we're really doing is doing damage to the kingdom. Amen. He says, get rid of of the gods of your fathers, the gods your fathers worship beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and worship Yahweh, That's the, one, the one true God. But if it doesn't please you to worship Yahweh, choose for yourself today the one you will worship. The gods your father worship beyond the Euphrates River or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. As for me and my family, we will worship Yahweh. Third thing we have to do is we have to make serving God a priority. 
And he gives us the key to that. The way we do it is through fear and worship of God. And, and what, what, what he means by fear, and I look this word up, it's not fear as in you're scared of God, but it's out of a deep love for God. It, it, it's, it's when you get to a place where you love God so much that all you want to do is serve him and worship him. He also says, stop being so superstitious. He says, stop serving those old gods of your parents and your grandparents. And, you, know, you know, they used to carry the rabbit's foot in their pockets and, and they used to put those horseshoes over the room and, and, and they used to do all these superstitious things that don't make any sense. And guess what? We're doing them today. Budweiser has a commercial series right now and all it does is focus on the superstitions that we do when we're following our sports teams. We do it. I was in California. I was walking with some people from, from a church I was visiting out there and it was a group of us. And I walked on one side of a pole and the entire group turned around and walked around the pole They, they, they said it was bad luck. I never even heard of it. But I hear the children talking about not stepping on cracks, not breaking backs, and, and all these things are superstitions that we have allowed to infiltrate our houses. They're all types of things that you do before you do the thing that you need to happen. There are all types of things that you say. There are lucky rocks that you rub and, and things that you do at work, routines that you follow, but they all point back to not trusting God and serving idols. That's stuff that we do at Easter. That's stuff that we do at Christmas. Don't make no sense. Doesn't have anything to do with the Bible, with Jesus. We don't even question it. We don't even, we don't even understand how a bunny can have an egg. It doesn't even make sense. <laughs> a chocolate egg at that. But we get to a place in our lives where we take on these superstitions and, and we worship without even knowing these idol gods. Then the final one that we, we fall short on sometimes is that, that God of money, fame, I'm just saying. <laughs> And the fourth and final the key to making right uh, choices is by bearing all your idols. I'm not going to read these verses, but I do want to talk about them just for a second. And Joshua goes to the people. Now, I, I want you to go back and read this chapter. It's a very important chapter. I want you to go back and read it. Joshua goes to the people, and he makes a, what appears to be a very simple plea. Choose God or choose some other God. And the people say, God, we'll take God. Then Joshua says, now hold on. I mean, in order to choose God, it means that you got to put away all your idols. You got to get rid of everything that's not from God. And the people say, we'll do it. We trust him. We, he, he helped us out. He got us over. We're we with you. And Joshua goes a third time. And he says, now, the only way you can do this, because this is a holy God, and he will not allow for you to have any other gods in your life, you've got to make a promise. We're going to have to put a big stone out here or something. Everybody's going to have to be witness to this. You can't just do this. You've got to have your heart into it. And they say, yeah, we'll do it. And as I began to research this, and I wanted to really understand why does he have to go back three times? And, and I went all the way back to Abraham. And Abraham was in the exact same area. 
And he had the exact same thing happen. And he said to the people, he said, in order for us to move forward, in order for God to be our God and, and take care of us, we've got to get rid of all of our idols. And you know what the people did? They started bringing idols up and dropping them. Started taking off stuff, necklaces and statues. And he dug a hole right there. And he put all the idols of all the people inside that hole. And he buried them. That doesn't happen here. Joshua makes a plea. He says, in order for us to, we need to make a choice today. In order for us to move forward, to, to continue to be in the promised land, I need everybody to give up their idols right now. Idols going once, going twice. Nobody brings the idols forward. This is very important. Because so many of our bad choices come out of our idols. They either come out of people that we put up too high. They come out of habits and spirits that we have no control over. And the only way that we move forward, the only way that we make good choices, the only way that we're able to give the kind of farewell address that matches our life is that we bury our idols. We can't be like the Israelites. We got to get rid of stuff. We got to move stuff out of our lives. See, see what happens a lot of the time, we're struggling with something. We're struggling with pornography. So we take all of the movies and all of the magazines and we put them in a box and put the box in the attic. Come on, man. We, we struggle with lust and and, it's, and, and instead of getting, we get married, we struggle with lust, and instead of getting rid of our little black book, put it in a drawer. Instead of deleting those phone numbers out of our phone, keep them in there, change the name on them, right? Change the guy name. <laughs> Ladies, I'm coming to you. Hold on. We get in these relationships where we, we, we put these uh, people as idols over us and then we decide that we, we no longer want to be in them. I'm not living that life anymore. But we don't cut the contacts. We answer the call still of the, of the abuser. We answer the call still of the person that makes you fornicate and that pulls you into directions that you don't want to go. We continue to keep all that stuff, all those idols, all that junk right around us. And what Joshua says to us, we got to bury that stuff. You got to get everything that tempts you, everything that causes you to go in the wrong direction, everything that causes you to make bad choices that you have to live with. Got to get all that junk out of your life. God took Joshua from slavery to leadership. He took Joshua from slavery to the promised land. And he wants to do that exact same thing for you today. All it takes is one choice. Joshua made one choice. And that was to trust God. And that's, that's all we have to do today. Make one choice. Put God as the center of our lives. Put God in the place where we've got idols today. Move those idols out of our lives and move forward serving God. My challenge to you today is to take that farewell address that you thought of and identify every 
thing in your life that would take you away from fulfilling a life that glorifies that uh, farewell address. I want you to think about that farewell address. I want you to, to think about that conversation with your children. And I want you to think about everything in your life that will stop you from living. And the final thing I want you to know is God's waiting to use you. He wanted me to say some specific things in closing. I know sometimes we get addicted to things and sometimes we make mistakes. Sometimes we hurt, sometimes we hurt other people. But Jesus died on a cross so that every mistake that you could have ever made, even, even before you ever thought about making mistakes, even mistakes that you'll make in the future, they're all, they have all been forgiven. Every day, new mercy, new grace. It does not matter what's happened in your past. You can make the right choice today and completely change your life and change the life of your family. To God be the glory.